you may wonder what this is for, but every time I'm giving a talk on the Rainbow Bridge, we're making a video recording of it so that I can also remember my comments on it. It's a very strange thing, this book. I have to just say that in the beginning because where to start and where to finish, there is no place. You know, it's an ongoing process. I wrote this book, it's not the end of this book. I think the writing of this book was just the start of it, and now I am exploring the meaning of the book. The book itself came in a very particular and interesting way to me. I don't say, I don't use the word strange, because I don't think that um, anything is strange that occurs in our lives. Things may be different than normal, but that doesn't make them strange. And coming to terms with how this book came to me and how I wrote it and the process of its unfolding now as I go around and talk about it and um, um, people ask me questions about it, about its content and about its meaning and um, many other things. It's really the beginning of the, of the unfolding of this process. So, just to start with, you may have seen the book lying around in the restaurant here and also in other places around Rishikesh. Um, the, the, it's in a number of the bookstores and in various restaurants and cafes and, you know, hit, dotted here and there. So you may or may not be familiar with the design and how it looks. Is that so? You've seen it around? Yeah? The design is very, very intricately involved in its meaning. It's a, it carries a subtle meaning. The, the, let's say the gross meaning is in the words and the subtle meaning is in the design and the layout of the book. This cover, which I'll just take off the book, is a wonderful picture. You can see it's been cut in half. So that a rainbow is arching across the sky of this monastery, which is located up in the Himalayas, up in the uh, northern part of Nepal, in Mustang, in a valley called Muktinath. This is the only photograph of the whole book that's not taken by myself. All the other photographs, of which there is one on every page, is taken by myself over two particular journeys that I made up to this valley in Mustang in Nepal. But this particular photograph I found in a, a small internet cafe around the stupa of Bodhanat in Kathmandu. I don't know if you're familiar with Nepal and Kathmandu, but I lived in Bodhanat for six years and I saw this photograph there and I took it off the wall. It was nicely engrossed on a, um, and plaqued rather, on a piece of wood. And I took it off the wall and I took it to the owner and I said, please can I buy this from you? Is it your photo? And he said, yes, yes, I took it a few years ago in Muktinat. I said, please can I buy it from you and use it for my, uh, the front cover of my book? And yeah, he was very, uh, very amenable and said, yeah, no problem, you can, you can do that. Anyway, so I cut the rainbow in half at the center. So that when you open the book, you open the rainbow. I mean, what does opening the rainbow mean? It's, I leave you just a second to think about that, opening the rainbow. You cross the seven colors of the rainbow throughout the book. 
So you open the rainbow and you cross the rainbow bridge. That's not all. Here, I've laid it out violet to red. So you start at violet and go through all the colors to red. But in the contents, I label from red to violet. Each section runs from red through to violet. But when you flick through, it goes from violet through to red. Now, why do I do that? What is the point of that? Because this is a bridge. A bridge goes two ways. So you flick through from violet to red, but at the same time you flick through from red to violet. That's on the inside. So all these little meanings are subtly encoded in the design of the book. And this I have come to understand from talking to people and from going around and explaining the book is becoming a more and more familiar way to express dharma, dharma art. The meaning is encoded in the layout and the design and it becomes a symbol. It's not something that needs to be spoken. I'm telling you tonight because you've come here to listen to me talking about the book. But it's not something that needs to be said. It's a symbol. Your mind or your subconscious mind will understand that symbol just by virtue of it being in front of you. It's like blind advertising, you know? They put a sign at the back of the bar which bleeps on and off every three seconds. Absolute vodka. Absolute vodka. And you go up to the bar and you start ordering absolute vodka and you have no idea why. It's a way to contact the subconscious without speaking loud, aloud, speaking words aloud. So this symbolism is encoded in the whole layout and design of the book. I want to speak a little more about this in general because I believe that this is a very, very important uh, phenomenon that is occurring all over the place now in the world, is this uh, emerging of quiet symbols that are pushing against the external forces which are trying to dominate our minds through advertising and media and politics and education and everything else we come into contact in our lives. And these kind of symbols, and everybody can do this, all, all of us can, can, can do this, we can create these symbolic structures through art to counteract these forces that are becoming so dominant in our lives that we don't even know that they're dominating us. We don't even know that they want to dominate us. Anyway, that's aside. This is the design of the book. Subtle symbolism that speaks directly to the subconscious mind. Don't need to really analyze it or interpret it, but it's there. Now the content of the book. The book is split into two sections. The first is a, what I term as a root text. Root text means that it is a, an outpouring of words that obviously are arranged in an organized way. We can call it poetry, but it's not, um, um, it, it's a little obscure. It's not black and white in the sense. It's a little obscure. It's not black and white in the sense. It's not. Um, um, it's not. How to put it? It's not ABC language. It's more like Twilight language. It speaks to you on another level. But at the same time, you can, so you can understand it subconsciously and consciously at the same time. 
that's I think po that's that's a way of explaining poetry in general. Poetry does that to you. It speaks to you on many different levels at the same time. Whereas plain prose or ordinary writing sort of just catches your consciousness mostly. Perhaps it does speak to a, a, a deeper level at the same time, but mostly it speaks to your consciousness, your, your present consciousness that you are aware of all the time. So this root text, um, from start to finish, takes you across this bridge, this rainbow bridge. Now we're going to come to a, a deeper meaning or another meaning of the rainbow bridge here. It's not just a channel that goes two ways. A bridge serves to unite two places that are separated. So that when the bridge is put into place, there are no longer two places but just one place. There's no division between those two places anymore because the bridge serves as a way to unite what was previously separated into one aspect. That's the fundamental meaning of a, of a bridge. But here, there's a more subtle meaning because the bridge, the rainbow bridge, is a way that we connect between that consciousness that we are aware of in our mind as thoughts, as manifest thoughts, to that which is unmanifest, yet which is the seed, the potential of those thoughts which arise in manifest form. So let's say that's manifest and that's unmanifest. The bridge is going to take us between those two points, what is unmanifest potential to what is actually manifested as reality. Thoughts is just the start of it, because from our thoughts come our words, and from our words come our actions, and from our actions come our lives. We create our manifest reality. What? becomes our lives. So it's not even enough to start at our thoughts. We have to go back to that unmanifest reality before the thought even appears in the mind. What is there before that? So the Rainbow Bridge connects what is invisible to what is visible. I'll go into that in a little more detail in a minute. I'm just going to explain how it, the layout of the book is. So first you have this root text that is seven chapters or seven sections according to the seven colors of the rainbow. Then you have a commentary to that root text. So each verse of the root text is explained in prose in analysis, in, in you know, logic, in uh, you know, thought, in, in manifest reality, let's call it. So from obscure, you now have a, a revealing of what that obscurity is in the commentary. Now the commentary, for some strange reason, is nine sections, not seven because there's an introduction and an epilogue added to the, to the commentary. So there are nine sections. Now, I call the introduction infrared because it is the color that comes before red in the spectrum, but we cannot see that color. But we know it's there because there are, um, we know from x-rays and uh, other scientific facts that this color, infrared, exists. And likewise, the ninth becomes ultraviolet, which is beyond the end of the, the other end of the spectrum. So like this, the book starts with the root text, and then each verse is explained in black and white ABC language, or prose, so that 
it is not misunderstood. But there's also a, a negative side to that. I wanted to make sure that I could keep the authenticity of the root text by explaining it. But at the same time, I don't want to cloud your imaginations by saying it's this, it's this, it's this, you know? I, I also like that the reader will just read the verses and enjoy the text as he or she wishes. So that's why I keep it separated as, a, as just a text in the beginning and then as a root text and explanation in the commentary. So that's the design and the layout of the book. Now the content, here we come back to the rainbow and the bridge aspect. I think I'll just read the very first section of the, of the book, which is entitled The Pen. The pen is a comprehensive introduction to the whole meaning of the Rainbow Bridge. It's all inside this section one, the pen. It's also a way that I, as the writer, got my mind into the flow of the, of the writing. As the, the pen is talking to the writer and to the reader at the same time. There's, n now the pen is, is, is saying, it, it's really being quite bossy. The pen is saying, you, as the author, you must keep your mind in the right frame, otherwise all, everything you write is just a load of rubbish. If you don't put your mind into that right aspect, correct aspect, then everything that comes out is just going to be blah, 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 it's not going to have any real meaning. And likewise, the pen talks to the reader. It's your responsibility as the reader to also put your mind in the right frame so that you can read the words correctly. Otherwise, you will not understand the meaning of the words correctly. You will interpret them wrongly. So the pen is uniting author and reader. It is the bridge between author and reader, which is, I believe, the meaning of every piece of writing. Every work of, of uh, literature is somebody, a human mind, trying to convey a story containing a message, or a message, or teachings, or conveying something to another being. So the pen is the way that the myself as the author and also the reader who is going to read this must put their state of mind into the correct frame. I I'm using I'm using wrong language here because I don't want to get into the realms of incorrect and correct and right and wrong and good and bad and all that. But I've got to say, I've got to use words. So I hope you're sort of looking beyond the meaning of these words. So I hope you're sort of looking beyond the meaning of what is right and what is wrong and what is correct and what is incorrect. When I say that the author has to put, um, I as the author have to put my words into the correct frame of mind, I mean that if my mind is, is on some kind of trip somewhere, all I'm going to do is convey to you my trip. I'm not going to be conveying a truth to you as the reader. And likewise, if the reader's mind is on some trip somewhere, then the reader is not going to be able to understand the words because they're in too much in, engrossed in their own trip. So the point of the pen is that we put our minds into the correct frame of mind before we start to even read the rest of the text, which is slightly different to the first section. So I'm going to read 
a short part of the pen, the first page, and then I'll make some comments on this particular section. The page is blank, the pen wet, poised above the pregnant emptiness. Anything, anything may arise, may appear in forms that speak their truth through a multitude of displays. For inside each character, each letter, is contained the essence of the unity of light and sound. Thus with light as pure bliss, and sound as pure emptiness, the great truth is proclaimed. O oh, pen, please keep your true nature in mind, and form union with the empty space. Maybe I read it a little fast and you don't have it in front of you to follow through, but the page is a blank piece of paper and the pen is held above it ready to write on it. The sudden realization that the potential for anything, absolutely anything to arise on that piece of paper, anything, anything, anything at all, it could be anything. It's an infinite possibility. The pen in that moment has an infinite potential to create absolutely anything at all. I mean, that in itself is mind-blowing. You know, every day we take a piece of paper and a pen and we write our names and our addresses and our telephone numbers and letters and notes and less than before, of course, because we've now got computers and things to do this for us, but we take a pen and a piece of paper and we, we sort of bypass this infinite potential of what we are doing with a, the simplicity of a pen and a piece of paper. So that's why I call this pregnant emptiness. Pregnant because it's already ripe with potential and possibility. And emptiness because there's not absolutely nothing there at all yet. Yet the possibility for anything, or anything to arise is in that moment, is in that action, in that moment. For inside each character, each letter is contained the essence of the unity of light and sound. Light as the form, appearance of the letter. And sound is embedded in that letter. It's unspoken, but it's inside that letter. If you see the letter E on a piece of paper, you see, you recognize, your mind recognizes it's an E. But inside that E is an unspoken E or what, however your language pronounces that letter. It's unspoken, but it's in there. Automatically, just by virtue of appearing as a letter E, the sound E is in that. It's not yet manifest as sound, but it's inside that letter. So inside everything that we see as manifest form is that sound unmanifest but it is inherently inside that form. Thus with light as pure bliss and sound as pure emptiness, the great truth is proclaimed. So this form, what appears on this blank piece of paper, is creates a blissful sensation to the observer because the realization that it is just a shape that is created upon this blank space. This arises in the mind and the mind is like, wow! Anything I see, anything that arises on that piece of paper is an expression of infinite potential. That's all. 
It may be a letter E, it may be a picture of a cat, it may be a, a drawing of a, of a house and chimney with smoke coming out of it, like kids draw. Or it may be a literature, or it may be a piece of art. But anything that is arising from that blank piece of paper is just an expression of what has been placed on it by another force, which in this case is the pen. Now let's parallel that with our lives, this infinite space that we have around us and this infinite potential that we have to manifest absolutely anything. And the pen, the creator, our mind, is constantly poised above, within this spacious reality and can create whatever Whatever. It's an infinite potential. So this is written in these first few verses of the pen. And this is intended, it is intended that the reader place his or her mind in that correct frame by looking outwards at the space and remembering that the mind is that creator of what appears within that space through the tools of thought, speech, action. And the author also, I always talk about myself as the writer here, I don't, so I'm talking about myself as the author, um, also has to put the mind into that correct frame before starting to write so that the consciousness of the reader and the writer can be united. You are no longer a pen and blank page separated, but together you invite awareness. For as the letters appear, they stir the perception, the third participant in the game of being. So we've mentioned light and sound, but then we have also the mind, the awareness that has to create whatever is going to appear on the paper. Physically, the awareness through the pen will create the appearance on the blank space. I'm talking in double language here because I want you to try to keep the idea of the space around us as you try to keep the idea of the space around us as an infinite potential, our mind as an infinite uh, potent, creative, creative potential within that space. But awareness here is the key word, and awareness is the bridge that unites these separated points. Remember that awareness as an immortal combination of bliss and emptiness, whatever appears remains ever this. So I'm going to stop there. This is the first page of the pen, and this sets the mind in the right frame for the whole book to continue. The rest of the pen continues to describe awareness and keeping the mind in the right frame, and, um, and so it continues to the end where your perception remains ever as that nuclear energy of intrinsic awareness that appears as a multitude of its own forms, driven by its playful energy and blissful knowledge that it is actually nothing at all the mirror of awareness, ever revealing itself to itself, bliss and emptiness, dancing together in inseparable union. So, 
the very key point in the whole book is the use of our awareness as the tool, the ultimate tool to create our reality. That is our reality. That is our reality, meaning in the absolute sense, that creates our reality in the relative sense. So the union of this relative and absolute awareness is what will carry us from manifest reality to unmanifest reality and from unmanifest reality to manifest reality. A bridge goes two ways and awareness works always in this in this way, in this perfect um, combination of relative and absolute. Okay, so awareness itself is actually impossible to describe. I mean, we're, we're all aware of being here right now. We're aware that I'm talking in this room. We are aware that the fan is moving around on the ceiling. We are aware that there are voices outside. But if we just take an eraser and rub out all those details, we come back to a blank piece of space. And that is always present, that absolute space. And within that absolute space, this painted relative existence. So our awareness as the ultimate artist of all creation is takes its paintbrush and just delightfully enjoys the celebration of this appearance. That's how it should be, I guess. <laughs> If we take time to see through the details, then it actually appears like that. And this is, when I use the word bliss, this is what I mean by bliss. This realization of this great artistry going on all the time. This inspiration coming from awareness, awareness which is also the ultimate guru, the ultimate teacher, the ultimate expression of who we are and what we are and why we are and where we are and how we are and all the questions are sort of full stopped inside awareness. And compassion. Because within the blissful understanding that this great painted artistry of existence is but an appearance of infinite potential, there's this feeling of, of, of love for beings who are suffering by holding on to this as something which is real and which is actually creating a disturbance because it's knocking 
move you from one side to the other and here and there and because there's not an understanding that this fluid, spacious realm is constantly in change and in play and in the, the, the reds are changing to pink and the pinks are changing to orange and the orange is changing to yellow. We just have to watch the sunset to get that teaching. The sky changes all the time. Clouds come and go. Colours pass through. And on the earth also, around us all the time, things are moving and things are... There was a car there just now, and now there's a, a lorry, and now there's a bicycle, and if you just look at a river for two minutes, it never holds its flow still. So this spacious encompass, encompassment of our bodily reality is constantly in change, constantly in flow. The artist tree is constantly rubbing out and redesigning and rubbing out and redesigning. So there's nothing to hold on to anyway because it's going to be gone in a flash. So when one sees beings holding on to their reality like they it's going to last forever, one feels, I'm not going to use the word pity because that's not the right word. Pity has an ego touch to it. It's too like, I'm fine and you're not. <laughs> you know, it's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that feeling of just, okay, you know, your lives are fine. Actually, all of our lives are fine. There's nothing wrong with any of our lives. Even if it seems that we've got some problems here or problems there, the problems are also just a painted mind, so-called reality, which is going to rub out sooner or later when the ultimate eraser comes along and the ultimate pen again creates a new design. It's just temporary. So this feeling of sorrow, sorry, sorry, sorry feeling comes up, please don't worry so much, it, you know, it's okay. Just, just let it, let it flow, let it go, let it move, let it, let it be what it is. And when awareness becomes the king of the mind, which it is always anyway, then it designs and rubs out and stays within its creation all the time. I want to also talk a little bit about the meaning of the Guru because I refer to the Guru many, many times in here but not in bodily form, not in the outer aspect of the Guru but in the inner sense of the Guru. Actually, whatever is coming into our mind at any time is a message from somewhere. It's a message from our awareness. Whether it's filtered through ego or whether it's directly penetrated as awareness itself, it is always awareness. The ego is like a filter that just clouds the awareness. But like the clouds go away, so does the ego. The ego likes to steal the whole show because it wants to take the pen and the paper and write its message. 
and make you limits, rules and regulations. Like, <clears throat> you are under my mastership. <clears throat> you will obey my command no matter where you go and what you do. So, you know, it's again, just an erase, erasing of this filter that is uh, also temporary. Awareness is perhaps the most simple thing that we have been given as a human, or that we have inherently as a human. It just is our being, it just is who we are. When we strip ourselves of everything else, we are just in the end this pure awareness. So coming back to the guru, the meaning of the inner guru, is this contact and connection with awareness. But because we are not aware of awareness, which sounds itself like, a, um, like an oxymoron, We believe that we are something separate from our own awareness and we create a persona that is seemingly has a whole identity of its own. When pure awareness shines through that persona, it just melts it into nothing, pure awareness. And mind it. Does that make sense? Who you are right now <clears throat> as a relative being, and who we are right now as an absolute being, they are inseparable. We are both simultaneously. There is no difference between the two. So when awareness or the inner guru shines through the mind and through that persona or identity that persona or identity becomes like a channel or a bridge. A bridge between unmanifest and manifest reality. So these are a, a few of the meanings of uh, the Rainbow Bridge. There are many, many more. And this is just the first section. I continue um, with some methods, some, there are some practices that you can do that will help the mind to get this connection. For example, section two, I read you just the first part. I pay homage to the Supreme Guru the perception of intrinsic awareness. In the core of my heart resides an empty vacuum of nuclear clarity, my intrinsic awareness. I am that intrinsic awareness. Arising as intrinsic awareness, I take refuge in the guru, intrinsic awareness, and rest in that nature. Realizing myself as intrinsic awareness, emptiness, knowing itself to be empty, pure and stainless awareness. I rest in the bliss of the empty space of intrinsic awareness. Feeling the bliss of that empty space, 
I rest in the nature of the guru. The fusion of blissful emptiness, great compassion merged with wisdom, my intrinsic awareness. I manifest as a multitude of light rays, the display of the union of bliss and emptiness. I am those rays of intrinsic awareness, a diversity of color, a proclamation of sound, the compassionate dance of blissful emptiness. I rest in my rainbow nature of intrinsic awareness. I rain down as colorful light from the sky of intrinsic awareness, and I cool and take form, becoming a paradise of infinite splendor. I rest in that spacious, blissful design, appearing in a spontaneously manifesting, multitudinous display of intrinsic awareness. I rest in the nature of intrinsic awareness. May all sentient beings, magical wisdom displays, of rainbow, light, and sound be liberated in intrinsic awareness. So you see, it all comes back to the first, very first verse that I read you in the beginning. The page is blank, the pen wet, poised above the pregnant emptiness. Anything, anything may arise, may appear in forms that speak their truth for a multitude of display. Everything is inside that verse, and it all comes down to how we use our awareness. So that's in a nutshell. I mean, there are many other uh, levels, levels meaning, you know, subtle meaning. Inner meanings, outer meanings, but that's in, in a nutshell what the book is about. The other thing that I've done here is to put a photograph on every page. Firstly, because while I was in the mountains on these trips, I took a lot of photographs and they were really. Um, I found that they had a, they also spoke a meaning. They captured this area of the mountains in a, in a way that I wanted to, I felt could enhance the meaning of the, of the book. So also to create space between the prose and the verse, which is quite deep in meaning and needs a lot of reflection, you've got this space of the photographs which you can, you know, if you're not in the mood for reading the words, you can just enjoy the photographs. And they also have a, a subtle meaning to them. So now I would like to show you my film, The Golden Bridge. This is not related to the Rainbow Bridge directly. But indirectly, of course, the meaning of the bridge is also in the film. I'm not going to explain anything about the film to you because you're going to see it, so you can watch it and enjoy it for yourselves. Shall we put it on? Okay. <laughs> 